I'm Ronnie Eldridge and I've got something to say. Well, I was born on Franklin Roosevelt's birthday, 1931, and the president always had a ball on uh, his birthday for the March of Dimes, which I think he helped to start because of his paralysis. So I always related. And my parents were very interested in politics. And it was during the Depression and FDR was somebody that was everybody that, that I knew looked up to, except for my best friend who supported Landon, but we used to wear buttons when we were five or six years old. Um, and I think that I basically was a political being. You know, I loved to hear about it. And in later years, I, I, I um, majored in college in government. I went to a wonderful high school, the High School of Music and Art, which was very political. My, my, civics, my civics teacher in seventh grade, Herbert Eben, had a club affiliated with Eleanor Roosevelt's national youth group called Youth Builders. And we would meet every week to discuss current events, and he would take us to town hall, which at that time had a weekly radio program, which was always a forum, and we were able to ask questions, write questions out and get called on. Uh, and we even met Eleanor Roosevelt, wow. who came to visit the New York wow. group and talked about the responsibilities of being a citizen. And I just grew up with that concept. And also with a concept about helping people. You want to help your community. So I went to college. I majored in government. I interned with Gus Tyler at the International Lady Garments Workers Union. I joined my local Democratic club as soon as I turned 21, which was the voting age. It was a reform club. We were fighting against the Tammany machine. Uh, I became very active. I loved it. I remember going to Tammany Hall for the first time being bitterly disappointed because it was a rented office on Madison Avenue office building. Mm -hmm. And they asked you not to smoke because the smoke hurt the county leader, the boss, his eyes. Anyway, my first job was at CBS. I always wanted to get to the news department. They never hired women. Uh, the young men started in the mailroom and they got hired on programs. We became assistants. I became an assistant, writing testimony and stuff for CBS. Uh, and then I had children. And actually, that was one of the greatest times of my life, being home with the kids. The, I was 29, so I thought I was older, but the other women in the playground were even older. But we were wonderful. There were also Russian mothers there who were here because their husbands were at the UN. So we were doing that. Rockefeller was building shelters, and we were fighting the shelters. And we fought the, the playground design. I remember getting all dressed up to go to the Parks Department because we said it's too dangerous. And I realized that we knew more than they did about stuff. So that was an enlightening moment. Uh, and then I stayed home a lot, and I was active in politics. And I wanted to work in the Stevenson campaign, but I, that was earlier, but I couldn't. Uh, and life just became that thing, and I, I became uh, close for some reason with Robert Kennedy when he was elected senator. The political things, I was a Democratic district leader by that time. And I got known as the person, if you were a liberal and you wanted to see him, you went through me to get connections to the office. And for some reason, we just liked each other, which, but I think I like Irish men, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he... We started with a project, he wanted to have Christmas parties for kids. This was before he became the senator, right before after he was elected. So he saw me at a couple of meetings, and then later I saw him at a political dinner, and he was being introduced to me. He said, this is a, just another district leader, Ronnie Eldridge. He said, this isn't another district leader. This is an old friend, which he kissed me. And then, so the word went out that Bobby Kennedy kissed Ronnie Eldridge, so she must know them. And it happened again at another dinner when I thought, I was sure he didn't know who I was, but anyway. And then after he was killed, uh, I sort of retired from that. And I don't know, they're just always a project. And then a friend of mine who was a Herald Tribune reporter had gone to work for Lindsay the year, the, the four years before, came and asked if I would meet uh, the head of the Lindsay campaign because they were going to need help. Lindsay was going to lose the Republican primary and they were going to run independently on the Liberal Party line and also independent. And I volunteered to be, uh, to organize the Democrats for Lindsay. And I had three kids. My first husband was a psychologist. 
I had met him in 1952 at the West Side Stevenson Keith Hour headquarters, mm -hmm. and um, we were married for quite a while, and then we had three kids. Uh, and then he died suddenly one night when he was 42, and I was 39. I had three oh children, and it oh was God. a changing point in my life as far as the question of being a feminist and of realizing what women had been trained to do. I, went, I mean, the story of my life was you go to school, you graduate, you go to college, you graduate, you get a job, you get married, you have children. And we never thought about what was going to happen in the future. So there I was suddenly a single mother with three kids to support. And it was really quite something. I was very lucky to have been working for John Lizzie, as who had hired me after the election as a special assistant to the mayor. So being at City Hall and being, it was very exciting times. The anti-war movement, the Vietnam War was on. Uh, the women's movement started now, had just been created a couple of years before. Uh, so I worked with the women from now about equity and other questions like that, with the anti-Vietnam protesters who wanted permits and help and they wanted to do this and wanted to do that. Uh, somebody even wanted me to get them canoes so they could liberate the Statue of Liberty, but uh, <laughs> it was the center of everything. And I also met for the first time a man who came to see me who was a teacher in the public school system who was a member of the Gay Activist Alliance, which was the early part of the gay and lesbian, trend, whatever, uh, movement. And his name was Mark Rubin. And we, um, I met these people from the, the Alliance and I became their spokesperson within City Hall. So I realized that my best thing was I was political. I always wanted to be more radical. I worked very well inside the government to help people outside achieve what they wanted. We started lead poisoning, the young lords had liberated, had gone around uh, with urine analysis kits to identify how many kids were suffering from lead poisoning. The city had never wanted to address it because they were afraid if they did, they'd never be able to answer the problem. Mm -hmm. But we did, and I worked on that. So that's how I ex came. But I also think with my first husband's death, I developed an empathy different from sympathy. I've been trying to think of what the difference is. That I could understand these poor people who were living in shelters and, and women mm -hmm. on welfare. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I, I, you know, having gone back to early life when I grew up trying to help the world or change the world, this was my way of doing it. When did you first run for office? It was an aberration, basically. What happened? Tell <laughs> By this you. time, I worked at Ms. Magazine. Mm -hmm. We developed a television series, the first feminist series on, on national television. And then I went to, then I was at Channel 13, which is the producing station. And I was doing the community and government affairs for them. And Percy Sutton, who was running Percy for mayor, Sutton. called and asked if I would run his campaign, which I didn't want to do. I couldn't do it, uh, but I thought, he's going to run for mayor, so why don't I run for borough president? I don't know where I got this look. I had three kids at home, I was supporting them, and I ran for borough president. I ran against, and then, because nobody else was running, then David Dinkins wanted to run, then Bobby Wagner Jr. and Andrew Stein. I still think I was the best candidate, but I didn't win. And um, so that was the first time I ran for office. I had met Jimmy Breslin years before through Robert Kennedy. Uh, we, he was one, I was traveling with Kennedy, and he said, I have to pick up this reporter. He's going to Vietnam tomorrow, and he wants to talk to me about it. So that's the first time I met him, but then I only, I met him through politics. He was a Udall delegate, and I was helping John Lindsay. It was all long, but, and he was very supportive when, Jim, when Larry died. So uh, years later, by now I was working at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey with their community and government affairs that's running the Washington office. And it was the time of the Concord and the noise and uh, the organized opposition to general, I forget the name of the radical group of clergy that used to, it was a Solomonsky organized mm -hmm. thing. So I was working with them and the feminist arts, we used some of Port Authority uh, facilities to let them have headquarters. It, 
it was another place that I was able to help, but I was making more money, which was basically the thing. Um, somebody called me, and uh, Jimmy's wife died years later, and uh, someone called me and asked me to call him to write, get him to write a column against a prison construction bond issue that they were issuing. I said I hadn't spoken to him for years. I had written him a note, but that was all. Anyway, I called him, and six months later we met, had our first date on New Year's Eve at a, wow. at a bar. He knew the bartender <laughs> at a very fancy bar, and all kids, we had nine kids between us. Wow. We got married that year. And that, um, then he was so close to Mario Cuomo. When Mario got elected governor, they wanted, asked if I wanted to join the administration. And I did, I decided I wanted to do women's issues in the state. We had an argument. They wanted me to do the Human Rights Commission. But I became the director of the Division for Women. I, um, one of the things that I got very involved in was not only domestic violence and also uh, uh, what do you call them? marriage divorce settlements, you know, uh, uh -huh. whatever, yeah. uh, and preschool education, and women in prison. Uh -huh. the, as a result of anyway, I went up to Bedford Hills, and that captivated my. It was an incredible story, uh -huh. uh, and we did a big conference at Bedford Hills. It was a wonderful superintendent up there. Uh, we invited a hundred guests, but we had every commissioner from the state that had anything to do with life, basically, the Department of Cor Corrections, social services, housing, everybody. And then we had women testify who had been victims of domestic violence mm -hmm. and who had killed their batterers. Wow. And as a result, we were able to change all of that. Wow. Eventually, I left the, uh, the Cuomo administration. And then, I don't know what happened, Ruth Messenger ran for borough president, and I suddenly found myself running for city council. That was in 1989. And, and how I long were you in the city council? For 12 years. 12 years. By that time, term limits had come. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think I would have quit anyway, because I don't think people should stay mm -hmm. in office such a long time in mm -hmm. one office. Uh, I was always in the opposition in the mm -hmm. city council. Mm -hmm. It was different from what it is today. Mm -hmm. It was run by a, a county leader, a, by a speaker whose home political club had two separate clubs, one for women and one for men. Mm -hmm. So you wow. could imagine. And coming from the West Side throughout my political history, when I worked for Bobby Kennedy, they would say, oh, she comes from New York, that started. And then when you work for the governor, they'd say, oh, she comes from New York City. And the city council, oh, she comes from the West Side. <laughs> you know, you're always expected to be more ahead of the general thing, and, but so they they made my role larger by always punishing me when I voted the way they didn't want me to vote. They didn't understand that. I learned um, the mediocrity of a lot of public stuff, uh, how government works more than I did from the city hall. Um, Giuliani was there, so mm -hmm. I learned from a different perspective. It was interesting, social perspective. The cable station for City University, CUNY.TV, asked if I would like to have a program, and I said I would like very much to do that. And tell us about your program. And at the same time, the same time I kept up with my work with women in prison, mm -hmm. and um, did quite a lot of work for them, and then for, especially for the women from domestic violence, and then from that we got into, I, with my program, I did a lot of, I do a lot of criminal justice, because I think that is the end of, that's where people who are poor, not well educated, too many of them land up there. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's, it's unjust. Mm -hmm. It doesn't serve, the criminal justice system doesn't serve the purposes I think it should. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's been hard, you know, that's been a, a passion of mine, mm -hmm. basically. The name Eldridge and it's basically Eldridge and Company. Right. It's who I want to talk to, and if I think of an issue I'm interested in, then I'll look for someone to talk about that issue. Um, if I'm stuck, I used to get my husband to talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I, I sometimes want to help some elected official, or I want to talk about politics, mm -hmm. or it it has a wide range. I, I'm suffering from the same thing a lot of people suffer from, which is 
the depression from the outrage we have about the Trump administration mm -hmm. and the government. I'm thrilled with the young people. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of jealous of AOC. Mm -hmm. I was talking with a friend of mine who was already in the city council, and we were, and she's also kind of a rebel, not as much, I don't think. Anyway, we were talking about the difference between the young women who are elected now, because they're elected without the political experience. They haven't worked their way up in the mm -hmm. political party system. Mm -hmm. And I really have very little faith in the political party system. Mm -hmm. They're totally free to make change. Mm -hmm. And what they bring, one of the things I learned about was the value of common sense. Mm -hmm. That's the basic for everything. And one of the reasons I was good in politics would be I would say to the candidate or the mayor or the governor, I don't understand what you're talking about. And if I can't understand it, then who else is going to understand mm -hmm. it? And basically that's it. But we're so easily intimidated by the language of different segregated groups, mm -hmm. you know? You try to read a legal document, you can't understand mm -hmm. it. You try to write a proposal for a foundation, mm -hmm. that's a whole different mm -hmm. language. And that's what, at the, and as far as I'm concerned, the church, or, mm -hmm. or I, I'm going to get into trouble, organized religion. Mm -hmm. It's all ways of accentuating the importance of these institutions mm -hmm. and separating it out. Because the government works only when it's forced to work. Mm -hmm. That's why my role inside was always, I thought, important because I would help those people outside who wanted to change. Mm -hmm. You need it. You need the people outside making, but that's changing also because now we have AOC mm -hmm. who's in it, but mm -hmm. she's doing the same thing. You need the people outside to start the discussion moving further out. Mm -hmm. You need the people inside to respond. To it. And that's very important understanding. I have a grandson who uh, thinks there's no point in doing anything because it's all corrupt. <laughs> and I'm trying to tell him that you really can do something. And I hope to be able to make that point to him. Um, it's very important. I mean, you can't just throw up your hands. You've got to realize that it's our, we have an active, necessary role to make our opinions known and to participate in the process. Regardless, that means to vote. Never let your, I voted every year's time I could vote since 1952. Um, it's just so important that people understand that they have that power. And it's very interesting this year with, the, with the, all these candidates. Absolutely. It's also interesting with some of the advocates, because some of the advocates are, are pushing sometimes too much, or people inside are responding too much. Mm -hmm. They're losing also their ability to be able to discriminate between what they really agree with and what they don't agree with. I don't know if that, I'm making that clear Absolutely. without being. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's very important. That you have to understand that. And I guess it helps to have an understanding of how government works, because it doesn't change overnight. But basically, it's if you think something's wrong, you know, be active and get something done about it. Whether it's a street light at the corner, or something at the Parents Association at the school, or like us in the Riverside Park, where we really change the design of playgrounds. It's very important, and you can do it.